Okay, our first technique is clutching the feathers on the orange belt chart. Feathers representing hair. You're having your hair grab, and the guys are trying to punch you or manipulate you into a very bad situation. Uh, technique uh, definitely works off of a lot of ideas of zones of obscurity. Still creates distance, stabilizes the base, tracks the arm, frictional pull down the arm, launching off the back foot into a forward bow, delivering the heel palm, and then we're going to strike across the person's face with the right hand. Then you're going to cover out to approximately 7.30. Okay, and clutching feathers, the guy's grabbing the hair, and as he's getting, he's getting a good firm grip on your hair. So as, I, as my hand comes up, I'm also trying to shield myself from the other hand. You can get a close-up here on the camera. I'm utilizing this type of wrist lock on the wrist as I'm doing it, which is off of the manipulation type of move that other systems use. Mr. Parker definitely looked at other systems and what they did and what he felt was useful and tried to utilize that type of thing. This is a wrist lock that you see in Aikido. Kemp, uh, Kempos use it, Chino, all different types of systems, Hapkido. And it's a, it's a popular wrist lock. When, I'm, when, the, when my hair is grabbed and I trap that hand, I'm, I'm coming up and I'm striking that hand as I grab. And I'm stepping back with my left foot, solidifying my base. And just that motion alone is taking him up on his toes and uh, making it very difficult for him to move and to hit me. He would have to bend his elbow to be able to reach me with the other hand. So as I'm going back to keep this arm from being able to bend, I'm going to track his arm to the target, which is in the armpit, striking with a middle knuckle strike, definitely doing some nerve damage there, trying to get on the opponent's nerves. So as I'm grabbing, I'm stepping back, boom, this is striking right in there, and this is going to track right down the arm, frictional pull, turning him into the heel palm, striking into the face. At this point, I'm going to take my right hand and strike across the face, and then cover out to a zone sanctuary. So I'm grab, step back, middle knuckle is delivered, vertical block into the extended outward block, tracking the arm, delivering the heel palm, and then I'm going to strike right across the face and cover out. So I'm grab, I step back, middle knuckle, come right up, heel palm, and strike across the face. Step back, middle knuckle, strike. Again, this is keeping him checked off by striking right up here into the armpit by by eliminating this arm over here, he's not able to hit me with this hand. I'm trying to turn his body sideways. If he's square to me, and I don't move him sideways, actually turn this way, this arm can reach me, and I've got a real problem. So creating distance, limiting the target, target areas, and you're still stabilizing the base. So, you know, you're always trying to stabilize your base and have a good foundation so you can stay on your feet so you have flight available if all things fail and go wrong. There's never any guarantees. So he grabs, middle knuckle, clears, strikes, and covers. Next technique is triggered salute on the orange belt chart. Um, this one, the salute is a heel palm. Salute in Kempo means heel palm. Uh, the heel palm is triggered by the person's push. Um, <clears throat> the very beginning of the technique, unlike the others that we had talked about uh, previous, was creating distance and clutching feathers. Well, this one's going to go forward. The first move is still just like, in my opinion, clutching feathers. Clutching feathers traps and creates distance and uses the right hand. Triggered salute traps and advances and uses the right hand. Continues into a crane and flaps the elbow, drives the elbow into the ribs, Back knuckles, shoots a vertical back knuckle thrust punch to the chin, and then covers out. The guy's doing the push right off the bat as he pushes, but leg check stops his forward momentum right off the bat. My heel palm's tracking his body. If it's shooting straight in, he can parry my heel palm and then put me in harm's way. But if my heel palm's tracking the body, hits the chin, drives my fingertips into the eyes, circle in a figure eight motion, craning that arm. I'm going to flap my elbow, keeping him in front of me, not off to a flank. Then I'm going to drive my elbow into the ribs, back knuckle across the kidney, and shoot the punch right to the chin. At this point, I'm going to check this arm and cover out to a zone of sanctuary. Once again, he comes in for the push. This stops the uh, 
is for momentum with the leg check, and this push triggers the salute, so the heel palm hits him under the chin. At this point, he would probably grab my hand, which if I draw my hand back this way, I'm pulling him on top of me, so that doesn't make any sense. I want to continue my motion in a circle and round off the corner and flat my elbow into his ribs. Drive my elbow straight into the rib, trying to puncture this lung. I'm then going to back him up with a kidney and whip that into his kidney and shoot this punch right to the jaw. Once that hits the jaw, I'm going to get out of dive and get rid of his arm, putting him at a zone of obscurity if I wanted to continue fighting or leave and cause some damage. As he's coming in to push, I move in, boom, stopping him, crane, elbow, elbow, back up with a punch, get rid of that arm. When he's pushing, get a close up of the leg check. This leg check will probably end the fight right there because you're taking his base away. This also, when a tall guy brings his head, once again push, into the heel pump. That's going to cause a lot of damage. You're going to get colliding forces on this shot and this shot here. Once this happens, the fingers go into the eyes. I've got a real good zone of obscurity at this point. I'm going to claw and take everything I can on the way on that eight path. At this point, you can see how it would be hard for him to reach me with the left hand. So I flap, and now I'm going to drive this straight in, tracking the arm just like he's clutching feathers, but instead of a middle knuckle, an elbow shot. Then I'm going to back it up and shoot that punch right in and cover out. Right? Okay, our next one is a uh, dance of death. <clears throat> this was uh, one of Mr. Parker's favorite techniques. Uh, the technique gets its name through the extension of the technique because you flip the guy over from his back and onto his belly and you more or less dance all over it. Uh, so it is appropriately named. Um, I like to start this technique when I practice it from a fighting stance. So I'm in my fighting stance. And the punch is thrown. It's a right shuffle punch like a boxer would like to do. I zone off, block on the center line. I curve it into a punch. You can see the good elephant's trunk in my punch. As he grabs his face, that's the zone of obscurity. I strike to the groin, he grabs his groin. My left hand's going to contour over the shoulder, tracking down into the leg, utilizing frictional pull. I'm going to step through his center line and drive my elbow right into his solar plexus or rib area. From this point, I track the leg, so I put right to my hip. Got a knee lock in above his knee. I'm going to back knuckle his other leg and heel pound him in the groin. Check the leg down, stump, track it, and cover out to his zone of sanctuary. We're going to start this one from a a fighting position. We're going to do it slow the first time. So Mr. Chris has his hands up. Uh, like I said, you can already kind of picture like the fight is already in motion. It's already in, in play. As he shoots the punch, I slip it and I block it and it, I, I let the block cause the punch to come out faster. As, as I pick this arm up right on the center line, I'm cutting him right down the center. I want to make sure I block on the center. Not over here at 3 o'clock not past his ear, right on his center line, cutting him right down the middle. One more time, sir, shoot that punch, boom, and he's gonna eat that. When he eats that and he grabs his face, we're gonna strike to the groin. Mr. Parker used to say, you gotta meet it to beat it or you're gonna eat it. This is a real good example of that. One more time, he shoots the punch, I meet it, so he eats it. At this point, he's grabbing his face, the zone of obscurity is created. I strike to the groin, he grabs his groin. My left hand follows right over into his leg as I do the inward elbow, picking him up, checking that leg, but I back it up with this one, clearing that out of the way. Strike to the groin. This knee's got this lock in, I can get a break in here if I want, I'm just gonna check it down, stomp, and go. Once again, slow, he shoots the punch. I slip it, he eats it. I strike to the groin, contour over. I've got a good check right here on his arm. As this comes over into the leg, causes him to go. Back it up with the heel pound, check, and cover. Get a close-up shot of this. As he's laying here, the leg's turned so he can't kick. That's a lot of pain. Right here, the foot's locked in on the leg, so the circle's closed. He can't kick with, uh, he can kick with the leg, but as he does, it's checked off. 
and the center line's exposed. When I check this down, this stomps above the kneecap. That's going to cause a lot of damage. This is going to strike the toes. Even if what I did didn't do the job, he won't be able to get back up and come after me. He shoots the punch. Thrusting salute. This is against the right front uh, snapping ball kick coming at your midsection. Uh, best way to block them this is to get out of the way so you are creating distance, limiting your target area, stabilizing your base. And then you're going to basically kick, you're going to place the opponent in a horse stance and you're going to be uh, sideways to that person in a neutral bow, limiting your target areas when you're going to deliver the kick and the heel pop. Once again, the technique gets its Name from the heel palm, the heel palm and tempo meaning salute. Uh, kicks coming at you, you create distance, target areas are limited, base is stabilized, your lead hand's blocking, your other hand's your back up. You're going to bring your lead hand up, cover yourself as you go to kick your person into the groin, you put them in the horse stance, and then there's your salute, the heel palm. At this point, you're going to cover out the opposite direction of the way that they fall, covering your center line, which According to the Kempo manuals, is 4.30. Mr. Davis is going to be in our left hip over here. And just demonstrate the kick force in the air, sir. Okay, so the kick is traveling down a linear path at you. So, let's move a little bit. So as he kicks, I'm getting out of the way. Like, and he's now in a horse stance to me. So I've put the bigger opponent in a horse stance, and now I'm going to cut him right down the center line with the kick. So I kick, he bends forward right into the heel pump. Now you can get a close-up shot here and see how the leg check could bring, also helps to bring his head forward and would also help to knock him down. And then we would cover out to our zone of sanctuary. Now this heel pump that's hitting him in the face, once again slow. When we catch him with this shot, the groin causes the person, whoop, the mouth to open their hip. As the mouth is open, we're closing it for him with the heel pump. That's going to have a compound effect here because if you catch him with the mouth open, the teeth can shatter. That's a knockout shot. He's definitely going to go over. And the thing is, it's taking him to his third point. That's where he's going to land. Mr. Chris throws the kick. And we cover out to our zone of sanctuary. A little bit faster. Wait. Next one is gift of destruction. Gift is there someone's handing you something, so it's a handshake technique. In gift of destruction, it's key important to get out of the way, to get off the line. Your first move, you're going to check the person's height by pulling downward a motion toward uh, 430. As I step off the 1030, I'm going to deliver my heel palm to his elbow, and my knee is going to take the thigh. A lot of people try and put the knee to the groin to bring the guy's head down into the elbow, but it's much better if you hit the thigh. If you hit the groin, sometimes you can make a trade. And a trade in this would be a very bad trade. You don't want to get knee in the groin. So as you're stepping, you pull heel palm and knee, inward elbow, and launch off your back foot and settling into the leg check. Uh, will also help to bring his head down into the inward elbow. This move is done very quickly. Speed is definitely an essential in this technique. You cannot take a stroll in the park on this technique. So when we're shaking hands, I can feel that the person's either grabbing my hand real aggressively or they're raising the shoulder as they're going to hit me. Some type of body language says that I'm now in danger. So it's a key essential point that I get out of the way. And as I get out of the way, I want to try and utilize two zones. So I want to check his height and I'm moving out of his line of sight. At this point, my heel palm is going to come up, my knee's going to take the leg, and I'm going to check his height and deliver the inward elbow. At this point, I'm covering out to my safe zone. So where center lines are lined up, I sense the violent action, I step, knee, catch him with that inward elbow, and then I want to cover out to my safe zone. Take it a little bit faster. Okay, our next technique is locking horn. 
points. This is against the front headlock. So the guy has grabbed your head and he's going to try and drive his knee into your face in the technique. Um, in this one, because you're bent over, the fight could have already been in place. Uh, a dozen and a half reasons how you got yourself in this position. But he has a hold of your head and you got a knee traveling rapidly at your face. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to not try and test strength. Your wrist is very small, the person's leg is very big. So you want to move it out of the way by striking in on the thigh with your left hand and your right hand is going to do an underhand reverse hand sword contouring the person's lower uh, groin area there. So as I'm bent over and I'm pulled forward, I strike into the groin and I borrow the person's force of them pulling forward. And when I do, I step right into their center, solidifying my base as I strike them in their lower groin area there. So I'm pulled over and uh, he's pulling me into the shot and I strike. At this point he bends over so I use my monkey hand to grab the testicles and crush them. At that point as he bends forward I drive my elbow into his solar plexus, up into his chin, my left hand shielding my face. I'm going to use a push down to bring his head forward. I'm going to strike the, left, the right side of his face with my left hand and my inward elbow is going to come across the lower side of his left jaw. This is called a sandwich. At this point, he's going to drop at my feet, and I'm going to cover out. This is a very, very, very aggressive self-defense technique. He's grabbing me here by my head, and he's going to drive his knee into my face. So as I step in, right off the bat, after I hit him in the groin, I'm going to get this arm out of my face. I crush the groin, and get him off me driving that elbow up. I push down, and I strike with that heel palm and elbow across the jaw. So he grabs. In comes the knee, I strike. At this point, as I crush, I can even use this arm to pull down into that elbow shot. I'm then going to push down, strike with the heel palm, the elbow is going to catch the jaw. At this point, I've got a nice universal cover in myself, and then I cover out to my zone of sanctuary. So he grabs, in comes the knee, groin, elbow, push down, step, and cover. So he grabs. drives the knee toward me and I move it out of the way and I strike him in the groin. At this point he grabs his groin and goes to bend over. Trying not to let him grab what hurts, I turn my hand to the monkey hand crush and I drive the elbow into the solar plexus striking him into the chin. At this point, if I hit him into the chin, he's going to want to fall backward. So I've got to push down very quickly, like quarter beat timing, bringing him forward. Strike with the heel palm right here on the ear, boxing this ear, hitting the hinge of the jaw. And I'm going to strike the other side of the jaw which we call a sandwich. So this hits, pop, and then followed by the elbow. At this point, when I'm done, if you notice, I have a nice universal checking him off if I want to continue fighting in various ways, it's all possible. And then I'm going to cover out to a zone of sanctuary. Lone kimono is our next one. Lone, like left one arm kimono grab, you know, like left one arm grab to your uniform. So as the person is grabbing the uniform, our left hand is coming up, trapping the hand, and I like to strike the hand as I trap the hand. Rolling the hand over so their arm is palm up. When I step back, getting a good break on the arm, I'm then going to clear the arm and deliver my chop to the throat, checking the arm, and cover out. It's key essential on the first move that when you're grabbed, your first move when you're stepping back, you're dropping your height when you step back and break that arm. Get a good clean break. Clear it, chop, and cover. Mr. Davis grabbing with his left hand, so once again I'm stepping back, stretching him out, getting a good break on that arm. When he's grabbing, striking, rolling it over. When this rolls here on this part, it's like I'm rolling the arm, so I expose this right here, and the elbow is going to cause that bone to shoot right out of this with the break. This is going to be nasty. So as I step back and I get that good clean break, I don't want to come around and jam that bone in my arm this way, striking down on the arm. So you want to strike so you clear it. And then move in on your chop to the throat. Come on back up, sir. Let's do it again. So I strike, break, clear, chop, and cover. Grabs, stretch, break, clear, chop, and cover. 
He grabs, break, clear, chop, and cover. So I roll the hand, and that cancels the other arm. He's still, if I didn't get a break, going to want to load up to hit me. So if I didn't get a break and he's loading up that hand, it's important that I turned his body right here. I've got it checked off with the leg, the arm, and this is going to hit it. If I can't get the throat, I can always take the face. Sometimes you've got to take what you can get. Next technique is glancing salute. Once again, salute meaning a heel palm. This is against the right cross chest push. So that as I'm being pushed, I'm stepping forward and allowing my body to turn, which allows their momentum to continue forward and their push allows the arm to straighten. We're also helping it to straighten and attempting to break it with a scissoring type block. At this point, I'm going to crane down the broken limb and glance the heel palm, thus getting the name glance and salute. I'm going to crane his head down as I push the arm in and then I cat back delivering my knee and elbow shots. At this point I'm going to cover out my zone of sanctuary. Mr. Chris is uh, pushing at this shoulder, my right shoulder. I'm allowing him to, see, to just continue his momentum past with the upper body but I'm stopping his base with the leg check. I could end the fight with the leg check and put him down alone just to give you the idea of the effectiveness of a leg check. Come on back up, sir. As he's pushing, my right hand tracks, so I'm catching it with frictional pull up the arm right on his center line, canceling his center line. At this point, I'm going to crane down the arm. As I crane, I glance the heel to palm right around the man's head, and I'm going to push the arm in front of him so he's checked off. Cat back, deliver the knee, followed by the elbow, and then I'm going to cover out to his own sanctuary. He pushes, catch the break, bring him down into the heel pump, head comes down to the knee, and the elbow shot. Okay, push again slow, please. So we break, we bring him down into the heel pump, we bring his head down, we cap back to knee and an elbow shot, and cover out. So this break, again, as I get the break, I don't want my hand to come down and get bone trapped in my hand. So as I do it, I want to contour this part of the arm, not over here, because the bone's going to stick out on this side. So when I come down, I want to come straight down, bring him in, knee, and elbow shot, cover out to my zone of sanctuary. Mr. Chris pushes, we get our break, crane and heel palm, head comes down into the knee and the elbow. Mr. Chris pushes, we get our break, crane and heel palm, head comes down into the knee and the elbow. And once again, real slow. Break, heel palm. This is where the technique gets its name. I've got him checked off with this hand, checked off here. I bring his head down. I cat back, I deliver my knee. His head comes up right into the elbow shot. Our next technique is five swords. This is definitely a Kempo favorite. Um, five swords, <clears throat> I tell a lot of people when they're learning it, environmentally, maybe that's one reason you can't step back. Uh, you want to just step into the person's center for numerous reasons. Uh, you could have a crowd, moving traffic, whatever, what have you, but you are stepping forward in the technique. So when you step forward, you're bringing up both hands to block. You can deliver your first shot to the person's throat, eye poke, uppercut, and bends over. You're going to move out of the way, turning his head, and then deliver your chop to the carotid artery. You cover out to a safe zone. Someone throws a roundhouse punch, uh, especially off their backhand like that. They're trying to put, you know, make it a final shot, so they're putting a lot into it. Mr. Chris, give me a good roundhouse. As you can see, uh, I didn't move, and I stopped his momentum. At this point, the quickest way from one point to another is a straight line. Right here, my right hand moving to his karate is a very close straight line. So as I hit that shot, I'm also using my forearm to help brace in case he's starting to shoot a left, start to shoot a left. You can see how this hand here has my face covered. Also, if he's starting to shoot that left, start to shoot your left, this is going to turn it, and then I, my hand picks up this hand automatically. So once again, throw the right roundhouse for me. Throws the right, he starts to throw the left, and it never is going to land or get there. At this point, once this hits him in the eyes, his hands come up, so he's not ready for that shot to bring him down. 
Once I brought him down, this hand's going to pick up on the inside of the right wrist as I turn his face with my left hand. I'm going to load up on this right hand and really come down on the back of his uh, neck there and put him right to his knees. When he throws the punch, watch how I stop his forward momentum with the leg check. That right there stops him. There's my chop, eye poke, uppercut, load up, boom, and cover. Now, when some guys, they like to get in fights when it's late at night, and I personally don't drink, but if you're fighting someone that is inebriated and has a lot of alcohol in them, throw your punch slow, you want to make sure after you hit them in the neck, if they're still up on their feet in the eye poke, when you hit them in the stomach, you're getting out of the way and then delivering your chop. He's bending over. You want to make sure you turn his head with your left hand. Come on back up, sir. So from this uppercut right here, as he's bending over, I'm turning his head right there in case he did vomit. He vomits over this way and not on me. A lot of guys don't believe that when they get hit in the stomach that with adrenaline and stuff flowing that they throw up. I've seen where guys have gotten sick in the middle of a fight. So I always emphasize to the students, make sure you turn the guy's head. One more time, sir. Slow. So he shoots the punch with block, chop, eye poke, uppercut, turn his head right here, the back of the neck's exposed. So we're going to track this arm and come right down on that shot and then come around to our safety zone. And one more time. buckling branch. Branch is representing legs. This technique is against the le left front snapping ball kick, stepping through. Technique starts as the person throws the kick. I'm going to get out of the way and get off the line. Delivering my down block. Get my hands up and check. Kick to the groin, plant the twist. Side kick, cover up to a zone of sanctuary. So as the kick's coming at me, the most important thing to do, of course, is to get out of the way. So I'm out of the way. I'm going to catch him coming down with the kick. At this point, if he's too close, my hand's checking his upper body, my knee can move his lower body, and I can deliver the side kick if he's in the way. Come on back up, sir. Once again, he shoots the kick. I'm out of the way. I kick to the groin. Deliver my side kick to the leg. I don't have to bump him in the butt with the knee. It's just something that I like to do. Come on back up. It's not written in there. Uh, be a little bit more graphic with it. Some people, when a kick's done, if you get a person that throws the kick and kind of just leaves it laying out there with you, some people like to pick it up and catch it. It's not something that I like to do, and they try and deliver the kick with the guy standing. Come on back up, sir. I prefer when the guy's shooting the kick just to be out of the way, because the best thing to do in a fight is get out of the way, and then try and catch him as his foot's coming down. So my foot's coming up. So as his body's coming down, he's running into the foot, getting colliding forces on my front snap kick. Once again, he shoots the kick, and then put it down. Now the last side kick, come on back up, sir. Let's turn around. The side kick that's coming down, it's coming, tracking the top of the leg and driving into the knee. Come on back up. The other choice is to take it low and hit it in the calf and put him down. Either way it works, but they're your targets on the leg. You get A or B. Some people have talked about hitting in the ankle. If you do that, you might fall back on you. So the idea is to try and keep him forward. Once more, let's shoot the kick again. So as he shoots the kick, I get out of the way. If his foot already came down, he could possibly turn sideways, turn sideways as I shoot my kick, and then we're equal again. I'd still be able to probably land my shot and go into something else, but it wouldn't be buckling branch. Fighting stance, take the kick a little bit faster. That's about the timing I'm looking for to catch it. Shoots his kick. Go back up. We haven't talked about environment. Environment's one of the first considerations in a fight. Environment's dictated as 
whatever's in you, on you, or around you. If you're fighting on the street, it's probably concrete. Guy gets hit in the back of the leg. When that knee hits the ground, that's going to do a lot of damage. When he does the nose dive, that's going to do a lot of damage. Well, let's also talk about his positioning. One more time. Shoot, skip. Right here, I'm out of zone of obscurity. So I'm getting off behind him on the first move. Back up. Shoots the kick. Now I'm behind him in this position. I've got my hands checking him so I can gauge his distance and put the kick in. Shoot the kick again. So I got out of the way and I caught him on the groin and I'm in a twist. If he raises up, say my kick was ineffective or he was able to check it off and he's turning. If he turns, he turns into a strike. If he turns back the other way, he turns into a strike. So I've got him checked at that point. You can always unwind and go to something else if I need to. Ideally, he's kicking from 12. When I'm done, you want to try and exit to about 4.30, right? Next technique is scraping with hoof. This is against an attempted full Nelson. We have three full Nelson techniques in our system. The first one is an attempted one. Uh, we don't let the person get it on us. The next one would be where they're just getting on, and the third one would be the third phase of the full Nelson where you're bent over. And they come later, so in the attempted full Nelson, the very first thing we want to try and do is not let him get his hands around us. And Mr. Parker directly said to me, he said, Jimmy, anytime you're ever in the heat of battle, the second you touch the person, you want to make them feel pain. Never forgot that. So, as the person's putting that full Nelson on me, the first thing I'm trying to do is track their hands and make it unable for them to use them and root myself to the earth so I can't be picked up or manipulated or moved around. And if I am, I will, I will be able to control them before they would be able to control me. So as the full Nelson's being put on me, I anchor down to the ground and root myself. If you kind of look at my feet, you can see my feet are, are gripping the, the mats. My toes are literally digging into it like a little squirrel digging. It's, claws into the bark of a tree, and I've got the guy's arms trapped, and I've headbutted him directly in the face. It's possible the guy might try and duck his head out of the way so the headbutt head might not land. At that point, I curved my hips, and I, I kicked my hips over toward uh, 130, so my hips are square toward 130, and I'm going to strike the inside of his left leg with my heel of my foot, and then kick out his right leg and scrape down. I'm then going to turn my hips, and I'm going to strike the inside of his right leg with my heel, kick out his leg and scrape down. And then I'm going to claw his face, creating that zone of obscurity. And since his base is so spread, he should fall on his keister. And then I'm going to cover out to my zone of sanctuary. So as James is putting the full Nelson on me, I head buddy and root myself to the earth and trap his arms. I then turn my hips, strike, strike. Turn my hips, strike, strike. And then I'm going to cover out to a zone of sanctuary. Once again, so I attempt to headbutt him and root myself to the earth, turn my hips, strike, strike, turn my hips, strike, strike, and then as I go to cover out, claw. Once again, he goes to put the full Nelson on me, headbutt, root myself, turn hips, strike, 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 strike. I like to add one of my personal favorites, scoop, and close. Next technique is grip and depth. This is against a headlock. Um, we had one other technique for a headlock and that was grasp to depth. And that was the first one. It's kind of in the headlock and they were stationary. And this one, the guy's twisting off toward uh, 1030 and turning his hips. So your first movement is to solidify your base and check his leg and you also you want to be able to breathe. The guy's trying to take your, your breath away. You know, uh, the very first thing that happened to you when you were born was the doctor cracked you on the keister, out went that uh, mucus shooting across the room and the track of life began. Now you got this guy trying to stop that track of life. So you're in a real bad position. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm turning my head so I can breathe and I have the option of biting him. When I bite, I have space on the outside of my mouth on each side so I can still breathe. So I have to breathe through the sides of my mouth when I'm biting into the flesh. At that point, that's going to make the person want to pull away. Remember, this isn't a sporting event. 
This is for real. You're trying to preserve your life. So I'm in this headlock position, and the first thing I'm doing is I'm turning my head. When I step with my right foot, my left knee's going to bend into his right calf, and I'm going to step to his center point, which will be 1030. My hands are going to load into the hammering position, and I'm going to strike him with two hammer fists in the groin and the kidney. So as I step, I'm timing it with the right foot so I get that marriage of gravity effect on him. At this point, my left hand is going to come over the chin, and I'm going to anchor using, it, uh, using his chin as a fulcrum right here with my forearm, bringing his head back. I'm going to crane the arm down, deliver my heel palm. At this point, I'm, if he's right here still, I'll check that arm as he's falling, and then cover out to approximately 1030. Once more, so I step, hit, heel palm, and cover. So I'm in a headlock. I've turned my head, I'm going to step with this foot, my left knee is going to go right across this calf. And I'm going to hit to the groin and kidney. At this point, my left hand is going to come over and anchor under the chin. I've got his arm trapped right here with my head, so he can't pull his hand out. I pull from back, bringing his head back. At this point, he can't kick me in the groin, because he can't bring his foot up, because my elbow is anchored down. He can't hit me with the other hand either. At this point, my hand's going to come up, track him up the body, and strike him right in the chin as he falls. And then I cover out to my zone of sanctuary. Once again, Mr. Hawkins, let's take it from a different angle. So I step, and I hit. And I come over, and I trap that arm up, and I anchor the elbow down. This is kind of a cool thing going on here. My thumb's right underneath the chin, and my hands are crossed his mouth so he can't bite me right now. I'm pushing forward and back, so it's real hard for him to open his mouth. I've clamped down on it, anchored, so he can't kick or run away, and I've got this hand trapped. This hand's gonna track right up the body as I get rid of this arm, and hit right to the chin, and then cover out. When we line up, we line up at a meditating horse. This is the warrior, this is the scholar. So our hands are like this. When I start grip of death, it's not written in there, but nobody says you can't do it. I like to take my left hand, come up, smack the person right about there on the back of the head. I like to have this hand come up and smack them right on the bridge of the nose. So when I start my move, I ricochet it right off my hand and strike him in the groin and kidney. Give me a little more for my money there, and that would definitely help to loosen up this grip. Come back up here, Mr. Hawkins. So if you watch this, I'll do this real slowly. This is catching his head. This is striking the bridge of the nose. I step off and I hit the groin and kidney, and I come over. Hook the eye socket if I have to, bringing his head back. Pull down on the arm, give him that heel pump. Come on back up, Mr. Hawkins. Let's take it a little bit faster. deals with like an eagle's talon, an eagle picking up its prey. And it's against the wrist grab, the man's doing a grab to my wrist. The second he grabs, the first thing I want to try and do is not test his strength. If I don't fuse my elbow to my body, James make your grab strong, and I try and bring my hand up, it won't work. But if I place my elbow against my body, then I can move my hand. So as I bring the elbow and fuse it to my body, I move my hand stepping in Cutting him right down the center line with this hand will kind of remind you of a technique we did earlier in the series, Five Swords. Uh, at this point, as I cut through the center line, I want to take that hand and I want to make it busy and nail it right to the ground. Once that hand's nailed to the ground, I'm going to pull him in kind of like pulling a tuna on a boat if you're fishing. As I pull him in, I'm just going to strike with my elbow and create that zone of obscurity clawing across the face, at the same time getting a break on the elbow. At this point, I'm going to anchor down across his shoulder to keep him from getting back up into the fight. As he goes to get back up into the fight and look at me, I'm going to circle my inward overhead elbow, giving colliding forces on his back as I drop my height. At this point, I'm going to heel palm him on the head and raise up on the elbow, exposing his rib cage. I'm going to drive my knee into his rib cage, plant, get a good clean break on that elbow. As I pull up on the wrist, I'm going to snap the elbow in here, and then I'm going to cover out to a zone of sanctuary. Once again, as he grabs, I step right in, cutting him down the center. At this point, I drop his height, 
nailing him to the ground. And I'm going to draw him in, elbow, claw, check, inward overhead elbow, heel palm, pull up on the arm, deliver the knee, break, cover out. Goes to grab, puts him down, elbow, claw, check, break, and cover. Now, as he grabs, we want to think about what his intent is. His intent is to either hit with this hand. If he's not going to hit, he's probably going to try and pull, like he was going to maybe go to a throw or a break. So as he grabs, and he would be stepping to do the break, this cancels that motion right off the bat. If he's going to punch, this cancels that motion. At this point, you might be worried about this leg. So if he was going for the leg, say with his hand first, say he's going to with his hand, I can always sit out and do the technique from the ground. Our next technique is repeating mace. This is for a left push. So the person is pushing, my left hand is coming up doing an outward parry. My right hand is going to rake across the kidney. Uh, as I do that, I'm going to use my body to reorbit the back knuckle to his rib cage. Uh, so I'm going to bounce it right from here. Some people, they hear the slapping of uh, the uniform and stuff in Kempo and they think we're beating ourselves up. Uh, we're using our body to reorbit the back knuckle, as, uh, as I'll demonstrate. And I'm also going to utilize what we call posing forces. My left hand, if I got the hand, and repeating mace, I'm going to make a pulling motion as I do my back knuckle. If I lose the hand, well, then I'm just going to bounce the back knuckle and check his arm. And I'll demonstrate as I do it on the body. But as the person is pushing, my hand comes up and I rake and deliver my back knuckle. So as the person is pushing, I do my outward parry, rake, and do my back knuckle. You can kind of see my hands pulling right here, so I'll be pulling the arm into the back knuckle. At that point, I pivot my hips. If I've got the elbow, I might be able to get a dislocation here, deliver my looping down roundhouse, and cover out. I'm going to have Mr. Hawkins and we'll demonstrate that for him. Whenever we're working on the body, you want to be real careful. You want to practice safety. One of the things that we like to do in Kempo when we practice, uh, we like to get the response from the person, but without really hurting them. So when I do my technique with Mr. Hawkins, I'll be hitting with my knuckle right here and then raking across. If I do that, I might hurt him. And I love Mr. Hawkins, so I don't want to do that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to give him a good swift slap right across his kidney here in place of a knuckle. And then I'll, when I hit him with a back knuckle, I'll be leaving my hand loose so I don't hurt him. When we hit, we leave our hand loose so we don't hurt each other. Uh, if you were to leave your hand tight, you would be doing so much damage, the um, person wouldn't be able to get back up. So as he's pushing, my hand comes across, race and back knuckles, so you can kind of see the effect that has on the body there. At this point, I turn, and I'm going to get a possible dislocation there, and then I'm looping down roundhouse on his leg. So once again, as he pushes, and I'm coming back up, let's talk about that a little bit. So as he's pushing, and I catch this shot here with the knuckle, and his body, his body kind of turns off, which opens up this area over here for the back knuckle. Come on back up, sir. So it's going to make his body fall forward. That means his head will be forward for the kick into the leg. So when you kick, he's going to go right where his head's leaning toward. The human body is kind of like a child's top. You spin the top, whichever way the top leans, that's where it falls. So it's the same way when you hit the person. Wherever their head's going, that's where their body's going. So as he's pushing, and I rake, and back up, one well, check. Look right where his head is for my kick. That's right where he's going to land from that kick right there. Once again, he pushes, checks, delivers the kick, and there he is. Come back up, sir. Now that kick, the looping down roundhouse, is starting here at the top of the leg and riding right into the leg to cause that buckling type effect. One more time, sir. Time. 
environment being the first consideration in a fight, whatever's on you, in you, or around you, the person might have an overcoat on. The same move when the person pushes, because the overcoat, we alter our targets. The same strike to the kidney, I'm now doing to the ear, and then to the face. You have to still that break and do your kick. So in the winter time, you might need to alter the target and change. Imagine it's like hit that ear, a little flick during the winter, and how that hurts. Let alone the way I do this to his body. Imagine it on his face. The <laughs> next technique is shielding hammer. This is against a left hooking punch. We've already had a technique for a left roundhouse punch where we did sort of destruction. Uh, well, shielding hammer, the person's too close to you to do sort of destruction, so you can't kick. Therefore, you can only use your hands. So it's, that means this technique starts from being very close. So as I step back, the very first thing I'm doing is I'm still going to solidify my base. I'm going to block with my lead hand. I'm going to limit my target areas. I'm going to stabilize my base, and I'll have my other hand protecting myself. So I step back. Getting a good solidified base because if the person is close, right off this punch, there's nothing saying they can't grab. Even if he threw the punch and I was able to save myself with this block, um, his head's going to be real close. He's going to be coming forward. So we want to make sure he comes forward into this strike. At this point, I'm going to launch my mass off my back leg, dip my elbow in, poke him in the eyes. So I'm going to track his face to get my fingers in his eyes. Then my left hand, my Left hand's going to be shielding my face as my right hand comes up, covering out to my zone of sanctuary. Now, when I do the technique, um, beginners probably will not have the skill or the torque that I'm going to be able to put into the block. But when I do the block, the person's probably not going to be able to use that hand again because they're going to be throwing it with a lot of force trying to hurt me. So as that punch is coming in, I'm stepping back, boom, trying to destroy that hand. Pop, take his face and elbow him and eye poke him. So as that punch is coming in, the main thing you want to do, throw it real slow for me, is try and catch it. If it's coming this way, I'm going to catch it on the radial nerve. If it's coming, say he had something in his hand, on the nerve. But they're my targets. And a lot of beginners, you know, we teach them on the inside of the body to be below the elbow and above the wrist. So this is the margin for error that the beginner is dealing with. Uh, as you get better, this is what you want. This is where you're looking to be. This is where you're looking to try and pick his hand up, right there at the joint so you can dislocate it. You dislocate that hand, he's not throwing it again. That's for sure. And now he's put his hand down, which creates an opening. If his hand's up, and my hand just tracks and hits him, you slap me. We hit each other. Now we can both do shield and hammer on each other. Uh -huh. Come on back over here, sir. So right off the bat, when he's shooting that punch too slow, that's my target, and you're going to get on his nerves. When you get on his nerves, that's time to turn his face so he can't see you. Now let's affect his breathing and blinding. That's cause and effect. So you're not just seeing the technique, you're hearing about the cause and effect that's going to have on the human body. This way you're not testing speed, skill, or strength. Now, when they, people fight, most people, when you watch them on TV, that's what people do. They, they watch TV and they try and mimic what they see. So they see the person standing like this and throwing the left, and then comes the right. So that's what most people do. We as capitalists understand scientific principles. The quickest way from one point to another is a straight line. I myself am right-handed. Therefore, I would want my right side of my body toward my opponent. So I have my right leg and my right hand closest to him. Now, the opponent will probably get in the fighting stance that I took, switcher stance, and he has his hand up. So he's going to try and jab. So as he goes to jab and shoot the left, boom, pop, pop, and out. He shoots the left, pop, boom, and out. Our next technique is a technique called striking serpent's head. Uh, Mr. Parker definitely named this one appropriately. Uh, the person is being very aggressive and grabbing you with both hands around the waist, obviously attempting to control you, take you down to the ground, uh, possibly throw you, throw you multiple uh, problems there when they're grabbing you. This attack, you're at arm's reach. So whenever I have students practice the technique, 
I like them to start out like this. So Mr. Tom puts your hands out and he obviously can reach me. So as he's grabbing, slowly grab around the waist, this hand's gonna glue this hand firmly to the waist so the person no longer has use of that. At that point, bring your, come on back. My left hand is gonna be striking from a zone of obscurity so he doesn't see it coming when I step back. So this hits right into the temple as I'm hitting and I wanna drop my height so I'm settling in a good firm stance. Also so he can't bulldog me over, take me down, get on top of me and do a, do a ground and pound session on me. So he wants to wrestle, so I want to make him box. But he, again, I'm going to box from where he doesn't see it coming. So as he grabs again, I strike to the temple right in here. That's very displeasing. You can probably see that by Mr. McCluskey's nod and face. At this point, I'm going to grab the eye sockets. Again, he's not going to be able to see and You want to stick your fingers into the person's eyes if you're defending yourself, not in the classroom. So in the classroom, just want to maybe place above the eyebrows and the person that's working with you wants to be cooperative because they understand they're on the receiving end of this. When it's their turn, they don't want you to stick your fingers in your, in your eyes. So you have to be real careful here. You're going to anchor the elbow going into a forward bow or you can drop to a wide kneel. You want to pull up on the arm to keep that secure and the elbow's anchored down. This elbow's fused to the body. At this point, I'm going to shoot my half fist into his throat, not allowing him to grab his throat. And I'm going to turn my left hand, clawing, and emphasize the claw on the face as I go back. Stay down. At this point, if you wanted to go on fighting, you're in position to keep fighting if you needed to. And you're going to cover out to a zone of sanctuary. Once again, he's going to grab, strikes to the temple, grab to the eye sockets. Anchor the elbow, raising up on the arm to keep him up. You don't want him to drop down. If he drops down and gets the leg, you're going to end up on your back. So the idea is he's grabbing, you want to keep him up. You don't want him going low. If one foot has to drop back and firmly secure your uh, stance. As you go back, you even want to let your toes even grip the carpet. The Chinese refer to this as rooting yourself to the earth. I want you just to drop back when you do the technique. Make sure your height drops and you want to get the shoulders going into it when you go. So as you're stepping back, boom, let that arm just come right in and strike. One more time, real slow. We hit. One more time. Real slow. This comes right around. Tracking his body. Once this hits, grabs, claw, bringing his head back, raise up on the arm. Shoot your half fist, not allowing him to continue to grab at that point. If this hand's starting to go down, as I claw, he's going to go the opposite direction, and I end up in a perfect fighting stance. If he, even if he was to stay standing, come on back up, Mr. McCluskey. Say the guy didn't fall. As you went back, you ripped, you shot your half fist. He's grabbing his face at this point and throat. He's not going to see the kick coming, and you are in position to keep fighting. He goes to grab, strikes. Brings his head back, half this, and claw. The next technique is called locked wing. We're in a hammer lock, meaning our hand is jacked up behind us. Bad position. You're in a horse stance. The guy's at your center line. He's got your arm jacked up behind your back. We have four steps of range in Kempo. I'm going to use the word contact. One, I'm out of contact. The next step of range would be within contact, like a boxer setting up for a jab, to get contact penetration, which is the third step of range. The fourth would be manipulation. As you can see, this is where we are. We're at the manipulation stage. To me, that is the fourth step of range, which I call the danger stage, if you're on the receiving end. You're in a real bad position. Let's switch places. So here I am. I've got myself in the fourth step of range meaning he's closest to me at the manipulation stage, and he's in a position where he can break my arm, and I've gotten caught, I've caught myself here in a horse stance. The first thing I need to do is to re-grab his hand. And as you can see, by re-grabbing his hand, even if he's stronger than me, and he's bringing my arm up, at least I've secured the hand to keep my arm from going up behind my back momentarily. So I want to grab his wrist, just to, not to really be able to control him, but to keep my own arm from being broken. Once I've re-grabbed, I'm going to step to his center line, cutting him down the middle. So even by just stepping to his center line, I've already now regained position. 
If I insert an elbow here, you can imagine the impact of this elbow hitting. Let's turn around for the camera. Put your head back right here. So I'm striking under the chin in a very soft tissue area, and it's in a straight line with the head. That's going to do an incredible amount of damage. When you think of, stand on the train horse, the idea of the elbow coming in boom, with a lot of power, like that hitting right there. That's going to break his jaw and probably stop the fight. But in Kempo, that's why I always say we train for overskill. Or some people like to use the term overkill. I prefer overskill. Let's grab. So turn back around this way. So here we are. I'm in the horse stance. Now when I step back, I circle this arm and hit right up into the jaw, cutting right down that center line. As he grabs, I'm going to keep that hand busy to keep it away from my face so he can't hit me. At this point, let's turn around now this way. I've stretched out this limb. So as I've hit him, I've stretched out that limb, kept the other hand from hitting me, and I've broken his horizon. So he's leaning back in what I like to call the limbo position, meaning he's really not in a position to fight here. He's trying now to straighten back up and get back into the fight. At that point, I'm going to borrow his momentum and break this arm down. Come on back up. So if we pull up Mr. McCluskey's sleeve, the arm bends this way. It doesn't bend that way. So as I come around, I'm going to get a good break on this elbow. Let's turn back around now. So here we are. He's got me. I go back, oh, shoot that elbow. I keep the hand busy. I break that arm down. I step back, make that hand stay busy. At this point, I'm going to heel pop him in the ear and let the fingers catch the face in the eye socket. I'm going to bring him right into the knee and then get rid of it. And then cover out to a zone of sanctuary. Sanctuary meaning safe zone. I'm in, a zone, I'm in a zone of sanctuary so I can survey what's around me in case there's more than one attacker. This is a good technique where if you did have a multiple attacker situation, which Kempo does cater to, you can use this guy as a shield in this technique. And that can sometimes be real useful. If you use him as a shield, he runs into his buddy, his buddy hits him, now they're fighting, and you can get away. That's always a good idea too. Let's try from a different angle. So we go back, we shoot our elbow, we keep his hand busy, we bring him down, drop him down, heel bound, knee, get rid of him. We elbow, keep him busy, bring him up, drop him down, heel bound, knee, get rid of him. We go back, we shoot our elbow, keep him busy, bring him down, drop him. You want to make sure that hand goes down. Once the hand's down, if I needed to try something else, whole new set of targets now. And we're going to do our third hand principle. Third hand principle meaning I've got my hands free, he's trapped, I could be fighting someone else, and then cover. Okay, number 18 on orange, Obscure Wing. Uh, Obscure Wing for, gets its name for a few reasons. One, the elbow, once it hits, is running obscure to the body, but the attacker is also at an obscure angle. So it's definitely named appropriately. He's got my shoulder, so it's a, he's grabbing your, shoulder, your right shoulder, cutting him right down the center. So I'm looking to split that right down the center with like right where I'm stepping. Also by doing this, pull back with Mr. McCluskey, I'm in a good firm stance, so it's hard for him to manipulate me around. What you want to concern yourself with is this right hand here. So as he's pulling back, I want to give him something to think about. So I'm going to elbow to the solar plexus, then I'm going to hammer this to the groin, he's going to bend over. As he bends over, we're going to get what we call colliding forces on the elbow. He's going to be bending down right into that elbow. So as this hits, boom, he's going up, and then I want to clear this arm as I cover out. As he's pulling me back and I've hit with the elbow, the hammer fist hits, also then you're going to turn your hand and you're going to get a two for one shot there. You're going to heel pump and allow the fingertips to also hit, and you're going to try and claw up the body as you elbow to the chin. When I say colliding forces, I want you to think of two trains coming together on a railroad track and then running into one another. One train is the elbow, one train is his chin. Let's try that again. Now, in the technique, when you're practicing it, you want to make sure that you step back and you get what we call toe and heel alignment. So your big toe is in a direct alignment with your heel. You want to be dropping your height and settling. It's another principle that you're utilizing. 
Your right hand is just pulling right to the hip. My left hand is to grab my shoulder isn't making a big circle. It's making a very small circular motion, tracking your own body. So as I step, there's the motion you're looking for. You want to make sure you're looking at the opponent so you can identify your attacker. You're going to hammer fist to the groin, heel palm to the groin, allow your fingertips to whip and dig in, and you're going to claw right up the body and elbow to the chin. He's going to fall backward. Whatever direction he falls to, you want to move to the opposite direction, keeping your eyes on him and surveying what's going on around you as you do your move. So once again, as he pulls to the, on the shoulder, you borrow the force, you deliver your elbow, your hammer fist, your heel palm, fingertips, elbow to the chin. I mean, when you practice, you literally want to see your opponent. The better you get, the better your imagination. You literally want to see the opponent, you want to see him bend down when you're practicing in the air, you want to see the opponent grab his jaw, you want to see him fall over. As my teacher used to say, you want to feel the flesh between your fingertips when you're practicing. You step back, you deliver your elbow, your hammer fist, your heel palm, your fingertips hit, elbow to the chin, he falls backward. Survey as you cover up. If you listen, that's the way your fingertips are hitting when you hit the groin. So the heel palm hits first, then the fingertips, and then you claw. One more time. Next technique is reversing mace. This is for a left step through punch. Um, as the person shooting the left, the most important thing, of course, to do is get out of the way. So we're in a fighting stance, we're in a right neutral belt, and our hands are up. The first thing you notice I'm doing is I'm framing my face. I'm using half, what we call half of a picture frame. That means the punch isn't going to be a roundhouse. You know it's coming straight down the middle. He could shoot a right, he could shoot a left. There's no guarantee which punch is coming. But as he does, my right foot's basically going to work like the center of a compass. And as the punch is coming, my left foot zones off, which means the punch is now deflected and my hand reverses, because the fist means mace. As it does that, my hand recoils off the arm, delivering my back fist. Now I'm going to check the elbow and deliver my looping down roundhouse kick. So the person's here and he shoots the right, and I step off very back fist, check, and deliver the kick. That's pretty much standard version of reversing mace. Um, remember in Kempo, we're supposed to elongate circles and round off corners. So as he's shooting the left, I can also take it where I catch him in the face there and do the technique. My personal way, come on up to James. Um, as the person's shooting, it shoots slow. And you step off, you can just check it and still do the same way and do the blow with the kick. Come on back up. When I do the move the way I like to practice it, um, adopting one of Bruce Lee's ideas uh, or Mr. Parker's, it's a good idea, huh? as you'll see. I'm framing the face and we're going to put the person in a fighting stance where they're shuffling and shooting it off the left. Um, again, quickest way from one point to another is a straight line. So if we put this fist here, and the straight line is right here where he wants to get to. And then he's going to shuffle as he does it. So the mass of his body is behind the jab. Mass times acceleration generates force, or as I like to say, pain. So he's trying to put the pain right here. So as they say in the Bible, do unto others before they do it to you and do it better. So as he shoots the left, I shoot my right as I step out of the way. He's probably going to want to grab with both hands. And I say, not today, Mr. Hawkins, and deliver my move. So I'm here, he shoots his left, he shoots his left, he shoots his left. So right off the bat when he shoots the left, I create the zone of obscurity. He can't see in the middle of the fight, he's been hit. Now I don't let him grab what hurts. Then I affect his breathing. Then I break the elbow, and then I take away his base. Next technique is thrusting prongs. This is for a front bear hug and your arms are pinned. Uh, when you grab, 
the very first thing you want to try to do is tuck your chin to protect your face. Also, as you step back and solidify your base and thrust your crowns, his head would probably drop forward and land on yours unless he puts it off to the side, which is possible also. You're just driving your prongs into his bladder. If you have a person and they had like thick clothing on or uh, they grabbed you and are trying to scoot their hips out of the way, another option is to drop back and bring the prongs from underneath and come up into the groin, solidify your base and check their width and height. At this point, you're gonna deliver your knee, side kick and inward elbow. From this point, we're going to cover out to a zone of sanctuary, 730, and drop him right at our feet, kind of like a bearskin rug with a sweep. So James grabs me with the front bear hug. I tuck my chin, and I step back and I drive my prongs down and into his bladder. At this point, I check his width and his height and his depth. I'm going to drive my knee into his solar plexus. Side kick and take out his face as I deliver an inward elbow. At this point, I'm going to take this arm, send it in front of me, and shoot, covering out, putting him right at my feet. So once again, he grabs, I tuck my head, driving my prongs down, checking his width, delivering my knee, side kicking the inward elbow. If I cut the elbow down, that's where he's going to land at my feet and cover. When he's grabbing and he scoots his hips back, move this one back for me, and I drop back. From, I can still come from underneath, hitting him in the groin. Come on back, let's do it this way. If he pulls this leg back, and I still drop, still come from underneath. Once I do that, I'm right back on track. Deliver my knee, side kick, cutting down. He grabs, I tuck my head, thrust my thumbs, deliver my knee, side kick, inward elbow, sweeping as I leave, and cover. So he grabs, I tuck my head, thrust my palms, check his width, knee, side kick, inward elbow. Cutting down, he falls right on his back. Our next technique is twisted twig. This is for a front wrist lock. I mean, the person has your wrist bent. So as I'm in the wrist lock, the first thing I'm doing is I'm placing my hand on top of theirs. And when I say place it, I mean strike it on. Once it's struck on, I'm going to, they're, they're going to want to grab their jaw. So I'm going to clear the person's hands down, bringing their hands down to their thighs. So I'm in the wrist lock, going to step in, elbow down, elbow, elbow, drop. One more time. So I step in, the elbow goes into the chin. Notice I'm dropping my height. I clear the hands down. My left hand is going to catch the jaw. As my right hand catches, as my right elbow catches the other side of his jaw. We actually want to go a little higher with this, and the jaw you want to catch him like right along the temple, and let the elbow catch the jaw. So I'm hitting on an X pattern with my strike. At this point, I'm going to elbow to kind of keep him up into the solar plexus, then drop into a reverse bow, and as I like to say, bust that cup. So this, for a person to know this type of wrist lock means they're experienced and they know what they're doing with the wrist lock. Try to use it as a come along, maybe nail you to the ground as a submission type hold, break your wrist, mox mix, lots of different choices. So the first thing we're gonna do when he puts that wrist lock on me is hit the hand, elbow to the chin. Bring the hands down, strike, elbow, and bust next up. So he has the wrist lock on me. By placing my hand here and stepping into the leg check, brings his head forward right into that shot. At that point, he leaves my hands alone and wants to grab his face and is probably going backward. And I go, no, you come back here for that. Then I want to hold him up with the elbow and then drop in on the hammer fist. So he has me in the wrist lock, elbow hits the chin, hands are down, hits, elbows, and drops. He has his wrist lock, elbow hits, could catch the face as you claw, catch him in the jaw, Hold him up with the elbow. When I move in for the hammer fist, this hand might catch him in the face. So then as I go to leave, I rip and hold him up with that forearm. Come on up, sir. That is sending to the dentist. I really believe that this first shot will send him to the dentist. And the last shot 
will keep him from reproducing another just like him. Come on up, sir. One more time, real slow. So he has me in the wrist lock, that elbow, rip down, caught him in the jaw, elbow, and bust that cup. Our next technique is obscure sword. Uh, the technique is properly named. The opponent is coming from a flank, meaning an obscure zone, and the sword is going to run obscure to his body, so it would be very hard to deflect. Once that happens in the technique, as the man grabs his throat, his head is also going to move upward, which is going to obscure the kick, uh, which we'll demonstrate for you now with the help of my assistant here, Mr. Davis. Okay. The person is grabbing on the shoulder here with the left hand. As he does it, he pushes you forward. And once again, you're trapping the hand because the quickest way from one point to another is a straight line. It wouldn't take much for the guy to pop you in the jaw right there. So you want to check this hand off. When I say check it off, it doesn't mean that he can't pull his hand out. Okay, so all you're doing is preventing this from being able to strike in the face and manipulate your body. Your left foot is solidifying your base when you step forward. And I'm stepping so I'm going to be splitting him in half. Basically, I'm putting him in the horse stance. We started out, he's at the fourth step of range, which is manipulation. He can manipulate my body, and he's at an obscure zone, so I can't see him coming. So as he pushes me forward, I solidify my base, check this hand off. I've loaded my right hand at this point. I'm going to borrow his energy as he's pulling me into his punch. He's not going to be able to get the punch there because I'm going to split him right up the center line and let this travel up his obscure zone. At this point, I'm going to turn my left hip, turning my body so I get torque in my kick and shoot my kick right to his groin and then cover out to his zone of sanctuary. Once again, he pushes forward, solidifies, bar the force, chops, Kicks the groin and then covers. One more time. When the chop hits and it runs this way and it hits his throat, you want to make sure that the guy's vision is obscured. So you're striking. Even if I struck in, you can see where his head's coming. If you're off when you're shot, you could stay in the fight. So when I strike, I want it to run up when I hit. Just like we did in Sword and Hammer, on well, number 10 in the yellow belt chart. So we're kind of borrowing that idea once again. So as the chop hits, let it run obscure. This should make his hands come up, because since you press the esophagus, the groin's wide open at that point. Uh, thank you, Mr. Davis. I'm going to demonstrate it once in the air. I'll push forward. The hand is loaded. I bar the force chop. Kick to the groin. And cover. Next technique is rain claw. Claw coming from overhead in the technique, thus named rain and claw. It's against the right uppercut. It's number 23 on the orange belt chart. Uh, this is one that's a real fast technique. It has a lot of different types of application. I'm going to show you two ways of doing it uh, with the help of Mr. Davis. In this one, I like to think of kind of like some people like to start the technique from a uh, standing still position. I firmly believe you should be able to do the technique from standing still or already in a fighting position. If I'm standing still and he's shooting the punch, I'm going to create distance and block. So my left hand is creating the zone of obscurity. As this is going to slide down the arm, causing frictional pull to draw his head forward, I'm going to borrow the leg check to help bring his head into the punch. This, what I'm calling here, I'm trying to tear the flesh from the face and down the arm. When I'm done the technique, if I were doing it for real, I would have to dig the person's flesh out from in between my fingernails. That's how excessive the claw is. You really have to back off the claw when you're practicing it with your partner so you don't hurt them. It's very easy to tear the retina of the eye, get your thumb caught in his eye. So you have to back off the claw when you're practicing it. Like I said uh, in the previous technique, safety. You have to be really careful when you're doing this. You can really hurt somebody with this. The person's giving you their body and letting you practice a a life-threatening technique on their body so you don't want to take advantage of it and hurt them. So you have to be real careful when you're doing it. I recommend you do a technique over and over and over again, slowly building on the speed, going through the embryonic stages of motion, which is compared to a child crawling, and then the mechanical stages of motion, which would be compared to walking, and then the spontaneous stages 
of motion, which would be compared to running. So you should do the technique slow, medium, and then fast. So as he's shooting the, technique, the punch again, once again, I create a distance, and I'm causing the arm basically to move in a circular motion like this. So it's dipping his punch out of the way, which opens up his center line for me to do the uppercut. In other words, he wanted to do the uppercut to me. And it's kind of like Mr. Parker. He had a cool sense of humor. It's like uh, he's going to do one to you, but do it first. So he's going to do the uppercut here instead. By doing the dipping of the elbow, he gets to do the uppercut instead of the opponent doing the uppercut to you. The claw creates the zone of obscurity. Now, as he's shooting it, once again, I said it's a circle, basically moving like this, and he's punching with a circle going this way. So one circle's cutting the other circle. Once again, he shoots the punch. So I dip and claw. He should want to grab his face with the left hand. At that point, I'm going to utilize my leg check as I bring him into the punch. Uh, at that point, you can see I have a whole new set of targets if I want to continue fighting, but we're just going to stomp and go. Once again, he shoots the punch, and I dip the elbow, claw, shoot the, back, the vertical back with the punch to the hinge of the jaw, turning his face away, letting this slide down the arm, and then cover. One more time. Now, when I do the move, I also would like to utilize a back fist instead of the, the punch. So I like to claw it, shoot the back fist, which to me is much more appealing. Uh, when the back fist tracks the arm, it hits right behind the hinge of the jaw. That turns his head and kind of causes the jaw to shift. So that's what I, the way I like to do the technique. I learned it this way, and it just seems that it fits my body better with the back fist. So, one more time. If I'm already in the fighting position, especially, block ball back fist works real well. Locked, claw, tracked, let it cut the uh, arm with my claw, utilizing the elastic recoil, which is real popular in Kemba. You can see how, at this point, his width and height and depth is all checked off. And then I'm going to cover. So I dip the elbow. There's the dipping of the circle, cutting the circle. The claw, with the dipping of the circle, I'm going to shoot the vertical back up and track it into the jaw. That's how it's written. That's how it was taught to me. I prefer, once again, the claw and then the back fist. So if I'm already in the fighting stance and the punch is thrown, the block with the claw, that stops his uh, forward momentum. My arm is going to track his arm and catch with the back fist and then cover it. Punch is thrown, dipped, clawed, shot the punch, covered. If you prefer the back fist, clock, and cover. Okay, our next technique is the last technique on the orange belt chart, number 24. Crashing wings for a rear bear hug, and your arms are free. And it's a low bear hug around your waist. I always refer to it as the big guy, little guy technique. So we have the perfect big guy tonight for that. Mr. Davis, come on back out. Okay. Uh, I gave Mr. Davis the nickname the Gentle Giant. I think he's appropriately named that. Around the karate school, uh, everyone looks up to him because of his kindness and the way that he helps people. But tonight, uh, his kindness and his helpness is not going to save him from the wrath of crashing wings. So here we are. We're being grabbed in this technique around the waist. At that point, once I grab, the first thing I'm doing is obviously lowering my center of gravity. I'm putting my buttocks right on his thigh. In real life, I would be striking him with my head, which would help to kind of take off some of his momentum of pushing forward, that kind of thing. So as he's struck, I cat over. And also, I'm keeping his face turned away with my head, pressing against him. I've got his arms checked off. Mr. Davis, pull your arms out. At that point, I borrow that, step around his leg, and I'm taking his base away from him at that point. At this point, I borrow that some more as he's pulling, and I elbow him right under the jaw, and I'm going to check that hand off and make him lean back. I'm going to raise this hand up by my ear, reach around my face, Chris, to check him off so he can't reach around my face and grab my eyes. As, he's, as I'm breaking his horizon, he's going to start to fall. He can't defy gravity. At that point, in Kemper, we like to be kind to our opponent, and I'm going to accelerate his fall, and then I'm going to cover out to my zone of sanctuary. Let's talk about what's going on in there a little bit more. As I'm grabbed, 
The impact of the headbutt striking him into this part of the face, if the headbutt comes down on the bridge of the nose, causes the eyes to tear up, blood to come out of the nostrils. It's very tough to fight because your vision is obscured just alone from the tears coming out of your eyes. At that point, if we just take all the strikes out of it and I sit pick me up, Chris, it's very difficult for Mr. Davis to pick me up because of I've lowered my center of gravity. So by just dropping, that already makes it hard for the person to manipulate you. Uh, my arms are coming out and striking down on his. That's where it got its name, crashing wings. Your wings are crashing down on your opponent's arms. And you're striking very tender areas of the arm, I guess you could say, right in here, the nerve centers, as he grabs, elbows go right on it, headbutt hits. I'm gonna trash the hands up so he can't use them. I'm in a position to stomp on the foot with my heel here and break the metatarsal. I bypass that and slip right around and I use my knee to break his horizon down right back here. If you can see that, get a close in shot on that. I borrow his force and I'm striking him under the jaw to cause his vision. Also, he's looking up, he can't see me at that point and he's been hit right in the jaw. My hands protect me, I've raised my hammer up to come down on his bladder area as I make his body kick up into the hammer and then cover up. He grabs through the elbows, tat over, headbutts available, slip around the leg, elbow to the jaw, make him lean, cover out. about a what if to the technique. We have ideal phase in which we learn the techniques. The second phase is the what if phase. The more answers you have to your what ifs brings you to your formulation phase. You formulate what would really happen. When someone, the size differential, when they begin to feel the resistance in the technique, they could possibly be trying to push you forward push you under your face. Once they've felt resistance this way or this way, and they can't manipulate you, they're probably going to try and go forward. We're going to take that idea for a minute and go with that. So I get the heel and the bottom here, and now I've got him. 